The speakers we have tonight are truly fascinating people and they are talking about truly fascinating topics. So I'm really, really pleased to be here at our the science faculty of UNSW's inaugural sci-fi series, primarily aimed at our alumni, and I understand that there are about 180 alumni in the audience, so welcome, welcome back. Um, it's great to make a connection with you. Please do stay in touch. This is the inaugural event of the series and we will be um, having a different theme each time. So today is future health, uh, the next event will be future environments and then we'll look at fundamental research. So we'll look at quantum computing and astrophysics. Uh, so lots and lots of wonderful events coming over the next uh, couple of years. So we'll, we'll spread them out so that you're not exhausted by us. Um, but Tonight we will be inspired by some absolutely extraordinary tales and of course extraordinary tales are what science fiction uh, has always been about. Um, as it turns out a lot of what sci-fi writers envisage and, and write down and that we read often turns out maybe centuries later to come relatively true. And what we wanted to do with this series is really take you to the edge of the unknown with what our own researchers are working on, which you may not realise is already being done. Um, and some of what they see in their fields as the exciting next innovations. Uh, I'm Professor Emma Johnston uh, and Dean of Science at UNSW. I'm delighted to launch the flagship program, but I would also like to pause for a moment and acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And obviously uh, this building is built on <coughs> land that was, is, and always will be theirs. And the Gadigal people are one of the many uh, clans who uh, worked and lived uh, and made stories and understood the Sydney region. Uh, and UNSW is really proud to uh, have an Indigenous strategy that really aims to make sure we recognise Indigenous knowledge, understandings, and respectfully incorporates those uh, understandings into our own curricula. So um, very big respect to the Gadigal people's elders, past, present and future, and to any Indigenous or Torres Strait Islanders who may be joining us here today. So I'd also like to, as I said earlier, welcome our UNSW alumni. Um, we have got a very strong alumni plan at the moment, and it's really to make up for a few lost years when we haven't reached out enough and engaged with our alumni. Um, we realise that you have a lot to give to us in your experience, in your connections, a lot to add to our uh, experience, especially our students' experience. Um, and we hope that we've got something to give to you in reaching out, and tonight is one of those events. Uh, please be aware that today's session will be recorded uh, and it will be available for viewing in the coming weeks. And you realise there's a question time at the end, so uh, as you sit there wondering at the words that are being spoken, uh, please do think up a nice short question that you might want to ask. Um, and I'll be chairing a session with the panel at the end of the three speeches and taking as many questions as we can fit in before we head out for drinks and canapes. So, future health. I'm just going to um, indulge myself by taking you back to 1818, to one of sci-fi's early pioneers, who in a way wrote about future health. So Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley and her wonderful uh, fictional Swiss natural scientist, Victor Frankenstein. Um, so Victor in a way was one of the first biotechnologists. Uh, he, he stitched together a person um, from many, many parts of other people. Um, and he created the fictional creature. And, you know, that fictional creature has become incredibly famous and has been often portrayed as being this terrifying monster. But in fact, deep down, he was a shy and lonely creature. And he was universally ostracised and feared. So, um, it's a fascinating insight into the mind of Mary and also what you can imagine when you get deep down into science fiction, possibly one of the first people to imagine humans creating human life. Uh, and that's one of the topics today. So we also have to consider half a century of Doctor Who. I know there's gonna be a few Doctor Who fans in the audience. 
uh, 13 different faces and forms of Doctor Who on our TV screens. And the Doctor's most enduring adversaries, of course, are the the Daleks and the Cybermen, and they are creatures that were once organic, but they've resorted to so much sophisticated bioengineering and biotechnology to replace their aging organs that they no longer survive in their natural form. So two incredibly powerful uh, cultural references in our society that both refer to the creation of life. And last year, New Scientist ran a bold cover story foreshadowing human babies conceived with neither eggs nor sperm, instead by using stem cells harvested from a small sample of skin from which eggs and sperm could be derived. Human babies could be made from the lab from scratch. And this concept is not fictional. In 2017, Japanese research was published revealing the birth of live mice pups using eggs the team had made from adult mouse skin cells. And in the same year, the high-profile British sci-fi writer Anne Charnock published an evocative tale, if you've read it, featuring a young couple strolling through laboratory wards to pick a child out from the rows of translucent gestational sacs growing genetically pre-screened pre fetuses. So there's a, there's a bit of a relationship here between science and fantasy or sci-fi uh, and it's been a productive and inspiring relationship that works in both ways. Um, if you're wearing a smartwatch, you'll know it was Dick Tracy who first um, sported that imagined compact wearable communication device on his wrist. And um, it was that particular watch, as well as Star Trek's communicator, that actually inspired the engineer Martin Cooper um, to create the mobile phone. So that was working in one direction. Jules Verne imagined the electric uh, submarines, space travel, and video conferencing. And we all love video conferencing, don't we? Um, H.G. Wells introduced us to automatic sliding doors in 1899 um, and a fictional atomic bomb in 1913. And in the mid 20th century, Arthur C. Clarke predicted global satellite TV broadcasts, online banking and shopping, and even global positioning systems. And all of those intelligent computers, robots, and androids of popular culture have enabled us to imagine artificial intelligence and machine learning, arguably easing the real thing um, of our daily lives. So I think there's an, a second really important issue at play at how important sci-fi is to us. Um, science fiction liberates us from the limitations of the known world. And scientific innovation itself often requires a similar rejection of the conventional ways of thinking. Science itself is a very creative process. And many of the greatest breakthroughs in science are the result of creative original approaches, of rewriting and sometimes completely reimagining the rules. And many are the result of taking what we know from two fields of research and smashing them together. Sometimes it's just two or three incremental steps beyond what we know and you're suddenly into the future. So today, advances in science, technology and communications are driving phenomenal transformations across every industry and sector, touching every aspect of our daily lives. And it's easy to become scared of these innovations. But when we understand them, when we work with them, when we have the opportunity to listen to the people who are working at the very edge of the unknown, they become much more real. Um, and they also become something that we can all engage with. And when we engage with research and technology, innovation, transformation and disruption, we can actually benefit from it far more than when we disengage. So tonight we contemplate the f um, future health. We're very fortunate to have three UNSW researchers in the fields of health and technology, all from the science faculty with us today. And um, I, without further ado, I am going to start introducing the speakers. They'll each have a short period to speak themselves. I'll introduce the next speaker, and then at the end, they'll all join me at the front for question time. So first of our panelists this evening is Scientia Professor Justin Gooding. Now, Justin and I have worked together for about 18 years or so now. Justin is a world leader in the field of surface chemistry and nanomedicine and he'll explain what that is. And he leads a team of over 40 researchers working at the nanoscale at the intersection of technology and human biology. They're all pioneers in the development of biosensors, bio nanotechnology, and in nanomedicine. 
and interestingly, during Justin's childhood, he, um, he was a bit of a cricket fan, so he spent a bit of time playing cricket. But the more important thing was that in between cricket games, he was frequenting uh, old cinemas, watching the old versions of sci-fi movies. Um, and so I think a lot of his time spent sitting in the dark there is where he came up with his inspiration for his later life. So please join me in welcoming Professor Gooding to tell us how nanomedicine is really being done. His topic tonight, ideas from sci-fi movies that are inspiring future health solutions from rapid blood screening to bioprinting cancers. Thank you, Professor Justin Gooding. And in fact, she stole most of my introduction of the talk. <laughs> so yeah, I do love sci-fi movies. I always have. Um, and, um, and one of the great things about sci-fi movies is unlike us, who we're, we sort of think we know what's going on, you know. How, how many professors have you met that don't think they know what's going on? But we're really constrained by what, what we think is possible. And of course, your average screenwriter has none of those constraints through generally lack of knowledge. Um, and so what, I, what they do then is come up with some really crazy ideas. And I think those crazy ideas end up being really fantastic ideas for, um, for inspiring us to do or giving us solutions to things that we didn't think were possible. So it's a real privilege to talk to you tonight. And I really thank you for coming out. And I'm going to talk to you about this behind me. That's cancer. That's a ball of cancer cells. We're all scared of it. I um, grew up and we're always talking about the cure for cancer. We still are, of course, but of course, uh, scientists and clinicians have come up with amazing advances in how we treat cancer and, and deal with that family of diseases. But the next wave, or one of the things that's going to really help us go further, is to have better ways of measuring things that can teach us what is the right treatment for you. It could teach us um, more about the mechanisms of cancer um, or the how eff effective your treatment is, or it could help us cure cancer. So why do I say the last thing? Because the number one best way to, to, to cure cancer is to detect it early. So for example, if you have colorectal cancer, we get it in stage one, 99% success rate of curing it. Stage two or three, we go down to 85%. Stage four, well now we're down to 26%. So if we can get it early before you show any symptoms, then that would be brilliant, right? Then we can really make a big difference. And so that really means going into the bloodstream. So here's our, our not so friendly cancer. That means detecting things in the bloodstream. But that's a real challenge because the amount of stuff in the bloodstream is really small. So imagine I have cancer. My cancer is one millimetre cubed. That's about a thousand cells. And so what that means is that I have, uh, sorry, about a million cells and it's budding off, each, each cell is probably budding off 5,000 proteins. So in my blood, that biomarker is at the concentration of two by 10 to the minus 15 molar. That's two femtomolar. To put that in different terms, that's about 600,000 molecules in 100 microliters, 0.1 of a mil. That's way less than we can normally detect with methods. So most methods need many, many more, billions and billions and trillions of molecules to give a response. But if we can get things in the blood, then we can really um, answer that challenge. And so how does one do that? Well, you'd think that we just have to have more sensitive detectors, but it's not true. This is technology from, not ours, from uh, 20 years ago. It's called a nanopore sensor. It can detect single molecules. So basically when a molecule goes through that tiny little pore, the pore is just bigger than the molecule, you get an increase in resistance and that's what these spikes show. Each one of those is an increased resistance. And you can start to see the problem. We're talking micromolar. So that's nine orders of magnitude higher concentration than we need to be able to detect. And you can see the spikes are getting less frequent as we go down in concentration. When we get to 15, when we get to femtomolar, we're going to get one spike every 10 minutes. To analyse a sample that's worth analysing, that's going to take us about 12 hours. I challenge you to sit there 12 hours waiting for your answer. And so what's the solution? And so the solution came to me from one of my favourite sci-fi films. Four men and a beautiful girl. 
off on a fantastic voyage, actually entering inside the human body, exploring an unknown universe, unknown dangers. They're tightening! I can't breathe! 24 seconds left. After that, you're in danger of attack. Come on. It's sheer suicide for all of us. You are there with them, sharing a breakthrough in motion picture. So, I said they were visionary scientifically, not socially. Um, but the vision here is amazing, actually, right, from a scientific perspective. So I've told you that these, we can detect single molecules with a nanopore, but we can't get low concentrations for two, and because they can't find it, right? Then we can, might be able to detect a single molecule, but it's never going to get there. The second problem with that construct, which is actually a brilliant experiment for single molecule DNA sequencing, the problem with it is also anything that goes through that pore is also going to give you a signal. So you've got no selectivity. So you could never use it in a complex sample like blood. But this film told us how to do it. You don't go wait for the thing to find the sensor. You go out and get it. Those people got into the little Proteus submarine and they went through the bloodstream till they found that rare thing, the lesion in the brain in the, in the film. So that's... And they've gone through the blood, they've been attacked by everything in the blood, and then they come out the ear and they report that they've done it. For me, that's like a brilliant sensor. You put something through the through the bloodstream, you collect the thing you want, and you report back that you've done it. And so how do we do that? Well, so here's our nanopore, and here's our one rare molecule. We know it's never going to find there, so we make a submarine, which is a magnetic nanoparticle. So because we can pull, a mag pull it to anywhere we want with a magnet, but then what do we do? How do we, make, how do we get the people who see the, can see the problem and solve it? Well, we use antibodies, your own body's natural defense against foreign things. We put them on the nanoparticles, and then when we think, then we capture it, and then we apply a magnet, and we block the pore. So unlike the other pore, we block it. And so you might say, well, so that gives us faster response. So that solves this issue of response time. What about selectivity? Well, inside the pore, you might notice these little Ys as well. They're also antibodies for the same molecule. Detect a different part of it. In this case, it's prostate-specific antigen as a model. And so we can flip the magnet back, and we won't be able to pull this out because it's formed a sandwich. But this one, which is not the right molecule, we could pull back out. And so we've gone from um, not be, having a mo technique that can measure signal molecules but can't be used very effectively for these low concentrations. Now we have something that does seem like science fiction. And I'll show you, to show you that, like, you can probably guess, if I like sci-fi movies, I also like cartoons. So I better show you some real data. So here's actually one of those experiments. This is a, a pore. This is the array of just nine pores. And you can see there's one, two, three, four things go in. We flip the magnet, two come back out. So we can tell two are specific and two are non-specific. So we can know there's two of them, the cancer biomarkers in that sample. And even with just nine pores, we can get down to that low concentration, subfemtomolar. If we increase the number of pores, we can get much lower. Um, and now we actually have technologies, related technologies, that can detect something called atomol, which 10 to the minus 18. So put it back in that context of how many molecules in 100 microliters, it's 120 molecules. So we can detect things way before any other imaging technology. And this one is to show you that it gives the right answer using a, a classic method. So for me, that's science fiction. We've gone from um, or almost like science fiction. We've gone from working out how much stuff there is in your blood by having an instrument that needs heaps of blood and heaps of, heaps of molecules, to a, and it gets one number. So we've now got a technology that counts single molecules. So we're not doing this by measuring getting one number. We're getting a, num we're getting a number for every single molecule, and we can tell from that, we can tell whether they're specific or not specific. We can tell them whether they're biomarker or not. So we can do things in blood. So for me, that's science fiction. So now you know I've got this one millimetre cube cancer. We know about it now, we've detected it. What do we do about it? How do, we, how do we tailor my treatment? So how do we actually get rid of this cancer? So this also comes from the movies, and you've all, the answer, and you've also already heard about it. It's alive, it's alive, it's alive, it's alive. It's alive. <laughs> So 
So please don't suggest I'm that crazy. <laughs> I'm not trying to make an artificial human. I'm trying to make an artificial cancer. So maybe I am that crazy. But why do I want to do that? If I can make an artificial cancer, well, then I can learn more about how cancer forms and how to cure it. Not only that, I can speed up the drug development process, save animals and stop things fa failing clinical trials because I'm making a more realistic model of cancer. Most of those tests now are done as cells on a 2D sheet. We're going to make balls of cancer cells that are like what you have in your body. Now, how do we do that? Well, actually, we're really lucky. Cancer cells like to come together. So this is a formation of a ball of cancer cells. I really like this, this movie because these two guys here are trying to work out whether they join the party. This guy says, yep. Yeah. This guy was miserable, stays miserable. But this is just done in, in solution. This is just done by hand in a buffer solution. You, you put the cancer cells, they come together, they form a ball. But in your body, that ball of cells is not just sitting in buffer solution. It's sitting in, a, an, a, in an extracellular matrix. So it's sitting in a whole series of proteins that bind to it and influence it. And that's what we really want to model. It's also got many different cell types. We'd love to be able to model that in a real, real cancer. Why would we want to do that? Because as you know, sometimes when you have treatments, it seems to work and then the cancer comes back more aggressive because the resistant cells have stayed behind. So can we tailor that treatment for you? And how would we do that? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? You just print the cancer. So with Inventia Life Sciences and the Children's Cancer Institute in, in UNSW as well, we have developed a 3D printer. And this 3D printer is designed just to make these 3D cancer models, to make balls of cancer cells. And it works, it's got its own incubator, and what we do is print first, we print that stuff that is in your body around your cancer cells, your extracellular matrix. And then in the middle, we drop some cells. And in we're dropping your, these cancer cells and we're forming, uh, we wait a couple of days and we form a ball of cancer cells. So as I said, people can do this by hand, but there's a lot of problems in then manually manipulating. What we can do with this technology is we can make hundreds of them really quickly. That 96 well plate that biologists like to use that you saw in the video, we can print that in just over an hour. And so that's, that was the cartoon, here's the real thing, and so here's the, the droplets going around that form the extracellular matrix. This is your cancer cells, and you can see that it forms this cancer model. So for us, this is super exciting because it just gives us so much control. We don't have one printer head, we have 10 printer heads, so we can do many cell types at the, at the same time. So these were actually done not with that beautiful pink thing, these were done with this, which the people in the lab called Frankenstein. I did not know this at the time. They did not know that I liked sci-fi movies. They were only aware of my predilection for romantic comedies. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure they made the, the final printer pink because I'm probably the only person you know that paid money to see Legally Blonde 2. <laughs> but this... This technology for us is pretty amazing. So we think this is an absolute game changer. We think this might be a game changer in the way that polymerized chain reaction was a game changer. We think that because we can make the problem with, the reason we do all our cell biology in two dimensions is because we've got high throughput. We have very low thru throughput with these 3D cancer models. And so now we can do it really quickly. We can make lots of them. We can get statistically relevant data. Not only that, because we've got 10 print heads, we can control where everything goes. We can put many different cell types in. And perhaps the most exciting thing of all is we've now shown that we can print primary cells. So we could take some of those cells, trap from the bloodstream or from your cancer, grow the cancer up, print it, and then see how it responds to drugs and tailor that drug treatment for you. So this could be your cells. And it's alive! <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Justin. Um, truly remarkable research. Our next panellist will venture into virtual reality, but you don't have to get your goggles on for this one. Um, so Dr. Jill Newby is a senior lecturer and clinical psychologist from UNSW's School of Psychology and is our only, oh, the best school of psychology in the country, by the way, just, and is our only speaker who is also a UNSW alumna. 
Jill completed her B Psychol and Masters, Psychology Clinical and a PhD all at UNSW, so we're super proud of Jill. She's working on how the internet and smartphone apps can deliver effective treatments for the two most common mental health disorders, anxiety and depression. By treating people online, we're hoping costs can be reduced and many more people can be reached regardless of where they're living across this vast continent. Uh, and it's a, an approach I think you'll hear that's proving very effective. Please welcome Jill Newby. Thanks, Emma. Um, thanks for the inv invitation to speak and thanks everyone for coming. Um, so my talk is really about fear and anxiety and hopefully by the end of the talk you'll figure out how to overcome it. Um, I want you all to spend just a couple of moments thinking about something you're scared of or something you've been scared of in the past. Now for some of you, you might be scared of cancer after the, um, the talk we've just heard, just those little cancer cells, might be, you might be imagining that in your brain right now. But others of you might actually be really afraid of public speaking. So the thought of being in my shoes right now, speaking in front of 200 people might make you want to vomit a little bit or get really nervous. Um, but other people, what's really interesting to me is fear is so completely different and varied. So for one person, you might be scared of spiders or snakes. Another person might be scared of crowds or flying. The person in front of you might actually be scared of dentists or needles or faint at the sight of blood. So what my job as a clinical psychologist is to do is to help people overcome those fears. And as you can imagine, they're very varied. Now these are some of the most common fears that we treat in the clinic, but you can also get fears so varied, like fears of buttons, fears of cotton wool, and other things like that. So what you probably don't realise is one in four people experience a fear so debilitating it impacts on their lives in a really negative way. So when you think of that in population terms, that means around 6 million Australians right now have a specific phobia. So it's a major problem in our society and something that we don't have enough clinicians um, to treat. What you also might not realise is fear can be really crippling for a lot of people. So even though sometimes people can have a fear but just live their lives like normal and avoid the thing they fear. So for example, if you're scared of snakes, you might just want, not want to go hiking, might not travel to rural areas because then you can avoid that, that thing that you fear. But, but I've worked with people who are so scared of crowds that they end up becoming housebound and really depressed because of it. I've also worked with people who are so terrified of flying that even though they had an amazing trip coming up months down the track, they would start to dread it and they would wake up at night thinking about how awful that experience could be. Um, I'd be wanting to take their, um, their ticket off them, but um, unfortunately I couldn't do that. Um, and I've also worked with pregnant women who were so scared of vomiting, that, uh, women that, who wanted to become pregnant but couldn't because they were so scared of vomiting. So you can see how fear can be really crippling and disabling for a lot of people. But the way that we overcome that fear, so the most effective and, afford effective and empowering treatment is called graded exposure therapy. So graded exposure therapy is really tackling a fear step by step. So if you were scared of swimming in a pool, you wouldn't jump in the deep end and swim in the deep end because that would be too confronting and too scary, particularly if you've had a phobia. So instead you might dip your toes into the water, get used to standing on the step, then start swimming in the shallow end before you feel confident enough to swim in the deep end. This is the approach we work with to treat fears and phobias. So with fears of heights, you don't start at this. <laughs> it's way too terrifying. And what ends up happening is that the client doesn't come to the session at all. They avoid me completely. So instead what we would do is step by step. So we might start by helping that person stand um, maybe on a chair, because even standing on a chair can make them feel really anxious. And then we might start by the, the bottom rung on a ladder, keep going up until they feel more comfortable, maybe one flight, um, one flight up the stairs, one story, and then so on and so on. And by the end of treatment, what we can do is we can get that person to the point where they feel comfortable enough to go on top of bridges, um, do the harbour bridge climb, and also go to the top of Sydney Point, Centre Point Tower. But in the clinic, there's actually some challenges of doing that. So one of the main challenges is for some things, 
that people fear, we actually don't have the stimuli we need to treat those fears in our clinic. So even though a friend of mine actually does have spiders in her office, I don't. Um, all I'm stuck with is images of spiders to help someone become more confident, which is just not enough. Some other fears like flying, there's way too big a step between what the person's scared of and being in the terminal versus the first step in the step ladder, which is getting on a plane and going on an hour flyer. So all we need is like a middle step. So that's where virtual reality comes in. So in virtual reality, I'm not sure, can you put your hand up if you actually tried virtual reality? Oh, so a lot of people, okay, cool. Um, so what you do is you put a headset on and you might have used it in contexts like gaming and other more fun things, but here we're using it in the clinic. So you put a headset on and as you probably know, the people who haven't, you're willing to try it in my clinic. Um, you put the headset on and you're transported to an entirely different world. And by doing this in the clinic, then we can actually expose people to very different situations to help them overcome their fears. So you can see these two examples. So even though those people know logically that they're not in that scenario, it doesn't stop them feeling like it's real. So you can see that woman in the middle picture peering over the edge of the top of a tall building like she's there. And this is actually the thing that got me really interested, the third um, image there. This is the thing that got me really interested in treating phobias because I tried that and I get a little nervous at heights and what, what you do is you have to walk out on a plank and there is no way that I would want to walk anywhere across those planks because it feels like if you take a step to the right or to the left, you're going to fall off a building and fall off the plank to your death. Now, we wouldn't start with that with someone with heights phobias, but you can see how we might use some lower steps on the step ladder to get someone more comfortable doing these, um, go, going into these situations. So I'm going to show, hopefully, if the technology works, an example. So this is an elevator. It's a miracle that actually worked. So this is an elevator scenario. Often people are scared of going up elevators because it's often a clear um, surround. So this girl is scared of heights. And you can turn all the way around to see what it would look like in the elevator. She's clinging on for dear life. <laughs> Even though she knows logically it's not real. So this is how we would treat fear of heights. We would gradually start at lower steps to the t point where they can go to the top of a tall building. So my research and my team's research has looked at treating a few different phobias. So what we've been able to show is that these programs can be very helpful for people who are scared of public speaking and social situations. We've also shown it's helpful for people with fear of heights and people with fears of dentists, blood and needles. And what other people around the world have also shown is that it can treat a range of different phobias, almost to the point where it's as effective as face-to-face -face treatment. So that's plane phobia, fine phobia and also spider phobia. It's also used to treat post-traumatic stress disorder in return war vets. But I didn't want to just stop there in working with these expensive programs that often take time and money to create. What, as Emma said before, my research is really trying to aim to get effective and affordable mental health care to the people who need it. So what I've been doing is working on overcoming a few barriers to accessing this treatment. Now some of those barriers are the 6 million individuals who have a phobia. We don't have enough clinicians to treat those phobias if they all rush to get treatment at once. A lot of our population lives in rural, regional and remote areas of Australia and only a few clinics, maybe one, one to three clinics in Sydney use this type of treatment and maybe one in Melbourne. So it's really not accessible to a lot of the population. And also it's quite expensive to develop these programs. And when we have people with such a vast range of phobias and fears, it, to, to develop one for one specific phobia can be very costly. So just to give you a context, five years ago when I started working in this area, I got a quote to develop um, to buy the necessary software and hardware and programs to use to treat five phobias and it was going to cost me $100,000. So any clinician or average person in the community as well as a poorly early career researcher like me doesn't have that funding to be able to pay for that and that doesn't even count all the other phobias that we can't treat without that. 
So what I've been doing is I've teamed up with the immersive technologies team at UNSW to try and figure out a solution to this. And that's an affordable and scalable version of VR. So you might be surprised, but all you need now to deliver these VR interventions is a mobile phone and a piece of cardboard. So this piece of cardboard, you can actually make this headset at home. It's called Google Cardboard. So in contrast to $100,000, this only costs $5. And you can get a little step up, a plastic version, for $20. So what this means now is that we can put the mobile phone into the headset and then play 360 videos which play real life scenarios or view other, um, other apps or other examples of virtual scenarios to help people with exposure therapy. So what I've been working on with my students is testing these interventions with people with fears of public speaking and fears of heights so far, but we've got a long way to go. So we've got a lot more research to tell whether these programs are just as helpful as the more expensive versions, whether they're as effective as face-to-face -face treatment, but also what I'm really interested in is to test whether we can develop and deliver these over the internet so then we can reach people in their own homes without requiring them to travel to our, um, to our sessions, and also so then they can treat their phobias, phobias themselves. So just in the past five years, what I thought was actually a pie in the sky idea about making virtual reality exposure therapy um, available and accessible to anyone regardless of where they live and when they need it, is actually now turning into reality. Thank you. Fantastic story from Jill, and I'm, I'm actually uh, scared of cave diving, <laughs> but I'm not sure I should be cured of it because then I'll probably hurt myself. So um, we'll, we'll leave that one to last on the list. So our third panelist is someone very familiar with uh, UNSW science, my immediate predecessor as our Dean, Professor Merlin Crossley, who's since taken up promotion as Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic at UNSW while maintaining a very active research team in human genetic diseases. So he is, uh, Professor Crossley is a molecular biologist and his ultimate research goal is to understand the fundamental molecular mechanisms that control our genes so that beneficial genes can be switched on and harmful ones can be muted or switched off. And that way we can hopefully uh, support some people to um, cure debilitating chronic conditions like diabetes or sickle cell anemia and combat that genetically. Now, some of you may have heard quite um, dramatic stories around CRISPR, the acronym CRISPR, and uh, work that's going on around the world, but particularly some controversial work in China, and discussions around gene editing. But not many of you may have had this process explained by an expert. So I'm sure you'll agree we're very fortunate to have a real expert here to explain those terms and to tell us some stories. Please welcome Professor Crossley. His topic is CRISPR gene editing in humans, what can could and should we do to our babies? Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. So I'm interested in editing genes. Does anyone know who wrote that? I think everyone would. And it's a famous speech. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. And it's always bothered me because it makes no sense at all. Mark Antony was giving a speech. He needed a tongue, a mouth. He didn't need ears. Why was he asking to be lent ears? And you can't lend people ears because they're non-detachable. And I thought Shakespeare was pretty good at writing, but he's made a mistake. This is an error. It was a funeral. He was a man who didn't like crying. What he meant was, lend me your tears. That's what he wanted. Want. And I thought to myself, I said to my teachers, We've, Shakespeare's made a mistake. It's a typo. It needs to be fixed. <laughs> and they explained to me that it was too late. <laughs> it was too late. I could not fix this unless I went back to the moment of inception when this was written and I'd been there and of course I've never succeeded doing that. The only other way was to go to every library in the world and do this single-handedly. I've never done that anywhere either. And so editing genes in every cell of our body is a little bit like that. And that's, and I'll explain this, 
That's one of the reasons why what we can do with gene editing is limited and also one of the reasons why people want to and are editing babies rather than editing cells in our body, although that's not something I do. So, um, so CRISPR, as Emma just mentioned, CRISPR is a new technology for making changes in DNA. And that's great from a health perspective because it means you can fix things. But you have to sort of know what can you do, what can't you do. So how many of you could fix a bike? Pretty much all of you could fix a bike. <laughs> how many of you could fix a cake? And that's deliberately hard. Has anyone ever made a cake forgetting to put the eggs in, forgetting to putting plain flour instead of self-raising flour, these sort of things. It's sort of hard to fix a cake because things are baked in. If you forgot to put the orange, the cherry on top, that's fine, you can fix that. If you forget to put icing somewhere, you can fix that. But it's hard to fix a cake. How many of you could fix a phone? <laughs> I mean, they're designed not to be fixed, I think. <laughs> But fixing a phone is difficult. Now, what are humans like? We're made of thousands of cells. Each cell has DNA that encodes a computer-like operating system in our cells. As we mature, certain things in our body are baked in. Our bones are baked in. The way our brain comes together is somewhat baked in. So we are like, a bit like bikes, a bit like cakes, a bit like phones. And I like to think we're like, a, we're like made of me Lego. We're not, like, we're not made of clay. We're made of Lego. And each module is a phone with its operating system. And then it's all baked together. <laughs> so you can see now, CRISPR is powerful, but it's got some challenges in what it can do. Now, I work on the principle of somatic gene therapy. There are some things you can get out and fix. If I said to you, I need some samples in my lab, probably the only thing you'd give me is your blood. Uh, people will donate their blood. You can get blood cells out. You can use CRISPR on them. You can get them back in. My lab works on sickle cell anemia. We're working on the technology, and I think it will happen very soon. Our labs, other labs collaborating around the world, people, the blood with stem cells will be taken out, fixed, put back in. So it can be done with blood. Heart, it's a bit harder to get the cells back in in the right number, but I think there are heart stem cells that could be repaired, used to, taken out, repaired, put back in to repair a heart. Skin, patches of skin, you can do it with that sort of thing. But somatic gene therapy, it will be a massive field. We work on this, and somatic just means body cells. Uh, but it is hard to get DNA into cells. People like Justin are masters at nanotechnology, getting things into cells, but it's sort of hard. Imagine a balloon that you've blown up and tied a knot in, and then someone says to you, okay, put a 50 cent coin in. It's sort of hard, but, <laughs> <laughs> but there are ways of getting uh, DNA into cells, but it's not easy. And it's hard to get the cells back into the body to get them to repopulate. You can inject them into the body. They'll find their own way to the right place. But th for them to dis uh, displace the damaged disease cells, it's quite hard. So people say, if you start when we're one cell, and if you change that one cell, every cell in the body will be a copy of that one cell. You've changed the whole body. So I went to a conference in Hong Kong and Jiang Qiu He made a surprise announcement that he'd modified Nana and Lulu, uh, two babies. And what had he done? He disrupted the gene that enables HIV to infect cells. So you all know HIV is a virus. It binds to a little uh, structure on the surface of the cell. There are some people discovered in Australia who have a mutation so that their blood cells don't have that gateway and they're fine. So he said, 
I'm going to make people. He had a particular reason in uh, this particular village. A very high fraction of the population had HIV infection because there'd been a blood contamination issue and many, many, many people had been infected and there was a stigma around HIV. There weren't the treatments available that we have. He said, I'm going to make people who are immune to HIV. And he attempted to do it. We will never know if it was fully successful. He made mutations in this gene. They weren't identical to the mutations that occur naturally in Australia and other places. But um, it could well be that the, uh, the babies are. We don't know. Uh, we don't know who the babies are. We will probably never know. It's probably best that we don't. I went to this conference, I spoke just before he spoke. I've never been to a conference with the paparazzi there before. Uh, and so the world responded uh, with the moratorium, uh, voluntary, and the Chinese government's made it illegal. And I'm pretty confident people tend to obey the Chinese government, so it won't happen. <laughs> but uh, in Russia, there's a Russian scientist now planning to do the same. So. Now the question says, will other people do it? I don't think they will in um, China. They may in Russia. But you don't need to do it because you might want to do it if you had a genetic disease running in your family. That could be a profoundly affecting thing. People often sort of think, oh, you know, we've had these for centuries. But if it affects the family, you may actually think, I wish our family were rid of this disease. But normally in genetics, anyone who's studied genetics at school, most diseases will affect one out of four of the embryos or one out of two of the embryos. These days, if you do uh, in vitro fertilization, you can check, you can make four embryos, check them, and only implant the ones without the mutation. So there is very little, there are very few reasons you would ever use CRISPR to modify a baby. People say, but they'll want their babies to be smarter, more beautiful, happier. If you want them to be smarter, send them to UNSW. <laughs> uh, if you want them to be more beautiful, you know, it's haircut, orthodontist. There's many, many ways. You don't need CRISPR. If you want to make them happier, be nice to them. You know, <laughs> there is no... People will want to do that. They will definitely want to do that. And the problem with doing it by CRISPR, even if you wanted to, is that these characteristics are affected by thousands of genes and the environment, and no one knows what genes to change. So, but let me just tell one thing, and we end where we began with cancer. There's a gene called P53. It was gene of the year one year. You realize we have that? <laughs> it was gene of the year. Because people discovered that in virtually all cancers, so we have two copies of it, it's called a tumor suppressor gene. In virtually all cancers, one copy and then the other gets disabled as we age. You've got trillions of cells, mistakes get made, and many of us in this room will have one mutant copy in one cell somewhere. If we've got two mutant copies in a cell, that cell may go on to become a cancer cell, and it'll happen to us as we age. It's a probability thing. If both copies are mutated, you may get cancer. Now, and I'll finish with this. Elephants tend not to get cancer, and they have 20 copies of P53. So would you give your children or grandchildren, or would you hope that future generations of humans, that we use CRISPR to give them 20 copies of P53 so that they were essentially had genetic surgery to vaccinate them against cancer. And that's a question I ask a lot and it gets various answers and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Yeah, I think the thing I worry about most is actually getting the wrong answer. Right. I mean, it's because, you know, the sorts of technologies we make, if you get the wrong answer, that, you know, the, they have a huge effect on people. Um, but I don't worry about science fiction. Oh, I do worry about science fiction, in fact, because Star Wars destroyed science fiction. <laughs> <laughs>
Are you worried about the future of science fiction? Uh, the future of science fiction is dead. Oh. <laughs> Jill? Uh, for me and my work as a psychologist, I suppose the main thing I worry about is these technologies and these innovations aren't getting taken up enough, particularly by clinicians. So there's a lot of reluctance in the community to be able to use these technologies in practice, partly because of fear, and so that's one of my concerns. Yeah, I'm relaxed about most of the CRISPR stuff. It won't go viral. Um, it, it takes a lot of time, a lot of money, uh, a handful of babies may be modified, but it's not like something will get out of control. I do think uh, there are some things called gene drives which could go viral, but again, it'll take us years. I'm not worried. My big worries are um, nuclear weapons and climate change. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's already some work, not necessarily in dementia, that's been done in term to provoke empathy, so to get a sense of what it's like for another individual from their perspective. Um, so I've, I've seen research on virtual reality to help people feel what it might be like for someone with really serious eye disease or low vision and then see what that world might look like. Um, but I think dementia is a really good application of that. So I'm sure that is happening somewhere. If not, it should. Fascinating question. I know when I've had those eureka moments, it's been a happy place. Um, but where, where does yours come from? Um, I actually run quite a lot. And I, what I find is when I'm running, that these things bubble along behind me. So most problems I solve when I'm running. Um, and then suddenly there are those flashes. Oh, I know what to do. Mm. And then I forget it by the time I get home. <laughs> <laughs> you need one of those apps to record it. Jill. I don't run, but maybe I do. <laughs> um, but my creativity probably comes from um, having a problem and then wanting to solve it, but also from a happy place, so getting really interesting experiences that you can apply to a different, um, a different problem. Yeah, I daydream a lot, and I, I do, yeah, I think, to my, I think about problems and I think I have the solution. And I always think my solution's right. And then I work on them for years and years until I find out they're mostly not right. <laughs> but it's a leap of faith. It's always a leap of faith. You're right, it's not logical. I think that has to be it. And then we work and work and work. And then we discover something else along the way. At least we have the techniques to find out eventually that you're wrong. Yep. Yes. <laughs> Uh, I mean, the first thing is not denying that they happen. So a lot of people don't measure the negative consequences or unintended effects. So we're, we're trying to measure them. So I think that's the first step. And then what do you do if you find them? I think acknowledging them early and then doing something about them or changing tack to a different idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to hurt our patients. Justin, a lot of your research is actually targeted at re reducing the side effects of cancer treatment drugs. Is that right? Um, not mine per oh, se. That's Maria. Come yeah, on. but in yeah. the I'm one of the directors of the Australian Centre for Nanomedicine, and, and the other one of the other directors, Maria Cavallaris, who gave the chief scientists and engineers breakfast this morning. Mm. You were all there as well, I know. <laughs> um, it's been a big day. Um, yeah, she does a lot of work. So one of the big areas of nanomedicine is delivering particles that try and deliver the drug to where you want and reduce the side effects. I think in our field, a lot of the big, a lot of one of the big hurdles is the fact. Uh, conservativeness of regulation that really stops a lot of technologies uh, going forward. So getting over those regulatory hurdles is a, is, is a hindrance to technology, but of course it's a, a benefit to people who use it mostly, right? Um, so I think that we still get a lot of off-target effects with drugs at times, um, but hopefully the regulatory environment is such that we minimise um, that. And around gene editing? So actually, I'm just looking out in the audience as a few of my colleagues. I'm glad someone's asked about unintended consequences. Consequences. We see a lot of unintended consequences in university management, actually. <laughs> Almost everything we do to the university to try to improve it has unintended and unforeseen consequences. Um, in the lab, though, 
most things we do have no consequence whatsoever. <laughs> no. uh, and it's, it's much rarer for us to actually have a uh, negative, but I'm a, a bench scientist, not a clinical. Yeah, thalassemia treatment um, and th so thalassemia and sickle cell are both um, mutations that affect uh, hemoglobin and uh, lifelong very serious disorders and it's true that the progress has been on the horizon for many years. Uh, therapy has gradually got better and I all I would say, it's a bit like when Justin began his talk saying, you know, we talk about getting the cure for cancer. And anyone sitting there would think, well, you've been talking for a while. You know, it takes a while. You cannot underestimate how difficult this problem is. But, so I always say to my kids, in my lifetime or in your lifetime, we will cure sickle cell anemia and thalassemia. But I never say it will be you know, at the end of my research project. It is just so hard. I don't think there are particular uh, barriers. The research, I actually think, in the field of thalassemia, the gene therapy research was translated prematurely, and that cost us a lot of money and time and difficulty. But now the time is right. With CRISPR and transplant, bone marrow transplants, new conditioning regimes, I think we will see progress now. But up until now, the problem has just been too hard for us. As the Dean of Science, I'll take that question. <laughs> Rebels are welcome, of course, um, but actually a lot of the cures, the innovations and the developments are step-by-step step incremental things. It's very romantic to think they're, you know, rebels out there working on their own, breaking down their paradigms, but actually we're all standing on the shoulders of giants, usually, and we're stepping by stepping, you know, working together in really large teams as well. There's this idea that we're all solo researchers, you know, tucked away in some little room working by ourselves, brilliant people just isolated and coming up with the cure. But in fact, all the people that you're talking to today work in, in research teams and we collaborate across the world on these projects. It does, however, take a certain type of brain to say, we haven't found the cure yet, we haven't found the innovation yet, the technology yet, I have to think a little differently if I'm gonna make progress here. And so there is an element of rebellion that has to be included in all of the innovation. And we get rewarded for that through research projects. If you're going to get an Australian Research Council grant, discovery grant awarded, it has to be something brand new, something no one else has thought of. And the Faculty of Science last year alone was awarded 40 new Australian Research Council grants. So there are and about 2,000 peer review papers were published by our faculty. So 2,000 brand new, where the rest of the community, the scientific community experts in their field say, yep, this is a new bit of knowledge published in the literature every year by the science faculty. So there's rebels galore, but I keep them in check most of the time. <laughs> Anyone else want to comment? Yeah, she makes us sit on a couch. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, think, them. I actually think a lot of ideas that have their time and we might be working right at mm. the forefront and, but with it's other people chasing the same ideas as us. I think there's actually very few people or very few things that are so far left field that they suddenly change everybody's thinking, but they happen. Um, but it's also a little bit like survivor syndrome too. You know, we remember the people that did the outrageous thing and it actually turned out all right. We don't know about the rest of them. We don't know how many people failed. <laughs> So I think the standing on the shoulders of giants, I think, is a really important thing for us to remember. Um, in, in my department, we have heaps of flexibility to work on the projects that we're curious about and that can solve a problem. So in that sense, then we're able to do that, which is exciting. And as the ex-dean of science. Yeah, so I always <laughs> encourage people to be revolutionary, but to be quiet revolutionary. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think it's, but I think your point is actually right, that it's hard, if you're 
you know, we all do quiet stuff, but you can't get it funded. You can only get conventional stuff funded. Yeah. So what you have to do is, um, it's the staff and the science faculty are pretty smart. You have to manage your portfolio of what you do with some conventional stuff and some leap of faith stuff. And as Emma said, you know, you, you've got to have some stuff which will put you on the map, but you've also got to have a sort of productivity. And you've got to be fairly quiet in your being a revolutionary because no one will fund a whole faculty of rat bags. <laughs> <laughs> Before we finish, I'd like to say a few thank yous. I'm sure you're all um, extremely pleased to have heard from our three fantastic speakers. I certainly am. Some science fiction writers make everything uh, sound very magical. What I think you've uh, heard today is examples of people who communicate their science with such engagement and excitement, but also in a way that is very translatable, where everybody can understand what's going on. And that's of huge value, and it's where the magic happens, but it's actually in the hands of all of us tonight. And so I think you could join me in thanking all of our speakers. <laughs> and I'd also like to thank the staff of the Faculty of Science and the alumni and engagement team who've done a wonderful job of organising the event. Um, obviously also uh, staff from the National Maritime Museum. It's a wonderful uh, um, venue for all of us to be able to work in. Thank you for the venue and the facilities. Uh, and given the overwhelming success of this evening, as I mentioned earlier, even if it hadn't been a success, we probably would have run another one. But since it has been a success, we, are, we, we will be running another one entitled Future Planet, addressing climate change and the environment, and maybe even a bit of nuclear war now that Merlin's mentioned it. <laughs> please keep an eye out for the details of that. Um, and now please join us in the Tasman Light Gallery for refreshments. Thank you.